With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halverson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning on the Agnet News Hour. Coming up later, we have this week's almond update, and we will hear about how you can recognize some distinguished members of the almond industry. But we start off today with a discussion on soil health. Joining us is Sid Paul, Assistant Professor of Geospatial Science in the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University in Indiana. Sid, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. We wanted to talk about soil health today, and you have done a lot of research, and you've done some digital soil maps in Canada and Sweden, and I'm very interested in this. I'd like to know, just start out by telling us what is a digital soil map? That's a great question. We know that we have soil maps, which are two-dimensional representation of different soil properties across a spatial gradient, and digital soil map is a, is an upgraded version of it where we use new generation advanced technologies like remote sensing, machine learning, artificial intelligence to provide more continuous and more accurate outcomes of soil maps that will be helpful for precise and site-specific management. So what is involved in creating the soil maps? So in a typical workflow of map producing digital soil maps starts from the field where we collect targeted soil samples from across the study area, if it's uh, if we are ma- mapping a farm, we collect soil samples from across the farm. If we are mapping a larger landscape, we collect soil samples from across the landscape. And in most cases, the soil samples are collected from predetermined models uh, so that we, we can capture the spatial variability very well in our models. So that's the first step. And in the second step, we put together data sets from different sources. So with data sets, uh, geospatial data sets, ranging from satellite data, drone data, laser scanning, or LIDAR data set, or soil survey information, and then topographic information. So these are the pretty common data set we put together in a geospatial database. And then the third step, we train those geospatial data set using the field observation so that we know what we get from a satellite picture, for example, what it means on the ground in terms of soil property. So if the, if, let's say if we are using vegetation index derived from a satellite data, when we train it uh, with ground observation, we basically tell the model, okay, this is the spot where we are seeing better vegetation health which means we may get better crop yield from this side. And that may be related to better soil health at that point. And then when we combine this information using different models, like we use models ranging from geostatistics to machine learning, and then final outcome is a map of specific soil property. So in traditional soil map that farmers are pretty familiar with, they only know soil classes. But in digital soil map, we can produce maps of soil carbon, for example, or maps of soil pH, soil salinity, and so on. So you're able to really break down more of the the composure of the soil and see what's really laid out there along the land. Yes. And one of, another interesting part of our valuable part of uh, doing digital soil mapping is that when we are using our traditional soil map, one map unit may cover a large area. It could be even a square kilometer, and we only get one value for the whole one square kilometer area, right? And then the soil could be highly variable within that map unit. But when we produce digital soil map, that could be produced at a really high resolution depending on the geospatial data set we are using for prediction. So we can go as fine as two meter to five meter resolution so that farmers can see the variation every two to five meter and then determine their management decision based on that precision data set. So things like soil loss and degradation are very important on farms to to keep track of. And these soil maps, from what I understand, can really help farmers pinpoint where issues are and know how to correct them before they become big issues. Is that right? Yes. So what are some... We are producing really 
high resolution data set that exactly telling the farmer which part of the field are low spot for soil quality or other management. If, by looking at the landscape or looking at the farm, we can probably uh, know or can see where the like low lying areas were probably greater accumulation of carbon or greater accumulation of fine texture soil, but at the same time, those part of the land may be uh, suffering from drainage issues, right? But when we are producing these maps, this is not those very obvious low spots or high spot. This is the whole field where we are producing highly accurate data set and farmer can design their management based on those precision data sets. We're talking with Sid Paul, the Assistant Professor of Geospatial Science in the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University. We'll continue this talk on soil health right after this. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Sabrina Halverson. We're talking this morning with Sid Paul. He is the Assistant Professor of Geospatial Science in the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University. And we're talking about technologies with soil health. Tell me a little bit about the Purdue Soil Explorer and how that can be used for analyzing soil health. Okay, that's a good question. So Purdue Soil Explorer is a program uh, that has been running for the last quite many years, and that has been developed and still being managed by Dr. Daryl Schultz, who is retiring soon. So I, I committed to run this program starting next year. So what Purdue Soil Explorer does, it took the uh, soil maps available on the Web Soil Survey, which is the central soil information repository from USDA. And Soil Explorer took it to the next step, especially for the parent material uh, information and to sh uh, properly exhibit the soil geomorphic relationships. So basically how the landscape formation or geomorphology dictated the formation of soil that happened thousands of years ago. And, and in our digital soil mapping framework, we are extracting those upgraded web soil survey information from Soil Explorer to inform our model. So if I want to directly relate the Soil Explorer information in for soil health management, maybe it's not, it cannot tell where the where we have like higher soil carbon or higher soil pH, but we can get a very uh, good understanding of how these soils are formed. If it's uh, what the soil texture is, what the main parameter was, and then those inform some of the soil health management decision. And with all of this that you're doing with the the digital mapping and the soil explorer, you're able to look at historical data. For the the soil as well, from what I understand, mm -hmm. and does that help with from looking at the historical data of the soil help to yes. understand That's what's very helpful for sure? Because so far in most cases we collect soil samples, collect soil data set, and after a while those are thrown away because they may not be helpful for anything else or for current management. But using this new generation digital soil mapping model we can use archival satellite information since 1980s or so to track changes in a parameter like soil carbon. And when we are calibrating those models, having access to those archival soil samples or soil data or historical soil data is very helpful because we can validate the information we predict from our digital soil mapping model for past soil health values. For example, if I train a model for the current time period, 2024, and use that model to predict soil carbon in 2010 using time series satellite data information, and if I have access to historical soil data from 2010, I can validate that prediction so that I have more confidence in my prediction or predicted output and, and that those information could be more confidently utilized for any management decision. -making. And also for assessing carbon credits. If we really are sequestering carbon from a specific management practice, we need to do a historical assessment of, uh, of the soil carbon because soil carbon takes a long time to accrue or and, and uh, be detectable in our models. So if we can train those models using historical soil carbon data and time series satellite information for the pa past 10 to 20 years, it, it gives us a bit better trajectory or prediction of uh, soil carbon dynamics. 
at field scale and at a landscape scale. Yeah, and do you think that this will become even more important technology as carbon sequestration becomes more focused? I believe so. Because most of the carbon sequestration technology we have available these days, we are, if I understand correctly, in most cases, they are quantifying soil carbon based on standard values of a, values of a specific best management practices or climate smart practices, but they're not, in most cases, based on actual soil measurement. What we don't have baseline data said, what was the soil carbon content 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or what would it be in the next 10 years? We don't know those because we are not training site-specific or locally calibrated models. Yeah, and it'll be important to be able to pull up that historical data to see what... For sure. So yeah. that we know that baseline from where we are working towards or... If we have the history of last 10 years, we know that, okay, how these soil carbon dynamics was behaving last 10 years in that landscape. And if we put in similar type of management practices, what we can expect in next 10 years or 20 years. And based on that information, we probably quantify soil carbon better. But again, soil carbon or soil ecosystem is extremely complex. And it's a complex system which takes inputs from the nature and inputs from the human. So it's really tricky to predict soil carbon. But if we at least have utilized historical data set, I think we will be in a better shape than what we are now. This is all very interesting. Is there some place maybe on the Purdue website or somewhere where our listeners can go and maybe see some of these soil maps or learn more about it? Soilexplorer.net is currently what we have which I explained before what SoilExplorer.net displays. But in terms of uh, digital soil maps, we I just started my lab just a year ago. So we are still setting up things. We are still working on producing some new data set. But in the next year or two, we will be sharing our new generation digital soil map from some of the study areas through the SoilExplorer.net website. And as well as to my personal research webpage, sspaul.com. sspaul.com. Great. Thank you so much. I This is all, like I said, the, te the technology, just the information is all so interesting. I look forward to seeing how it Thank progresses. You. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you again to Sid Paul. Coming up later, we're going to hear about the Almond Board's Almond Achievement Awards. We'll be right back. This segment is brought to you by Live Earth Products. To get to know a little more about Live Earth Products, we're talking on the phone today with Vice President Russell Taylor. Let's talk about LEP. What are the key benefits of your products for farmers in the Western Zone? So Live Earth Products, we mine and manufacture a ingredient called humate. Now humate is rich in organic acids called humic acid and fulvic acid. Now those are common components in your soil organic matter. And here in the western United States, unlike, you know, those places around the Mississippi going east, actually have very low organic matter. Now, your organic matter is key in, think of it as the pantry in the soil. So it's key to water retention, nutrient retention, nutrient cycling, microbial activity, those kind of things. So anything that's going to impact the increase in soil organic matter will also impact things like water holding capacity and nutrient holding capacity, which is a big deal here in the west when water is is not as abundant as it is in the east side of the United States. Now, what about nitrate? I know nitrate can be a problem in some soils. So how do LEP products help reduce the nitrate problem on saturated soils? So live earth products, it's not unique in the how we um, affect nitrogen, but any organic matter will help retain nitrogen. So typically, the mechanisms that we use are blending the nitrogen with the humate. So what happens is the nitrogen will attach to the humic acid, and you will see less of the processes that degrade or, or volatilize uh, nitrogen. So nitrogen will either convert to a gas or it'll be uh, converted by microbes into a nitrate and leach for the soil. So the longer you have that, that product is not being volatilized or converted, the longer opportunity for that nutrient to be used by the plant. We have university testing that has shown that when you blend these organic acids with the nutrient, you give that plant a longer opportunity to use that nutrient before it's lost, volatilized, or converted. To get to know more about Live Earth products, you can visit them online at liveearth.com. That is spelled L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. 
Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Sabrina Halverson. For this segment, we have an excerpt of the Water for Food podcast. Hello, I'm Frances Hayes, DWFI Director of Communications and Public Relations, and your host for this episode of the Water for Food podcast. Irrigation expansion can provide the water necessary to increase food production for our growing world. It can also be a means for moving farmers from simply producing enough food for their families into generating an income through export of additional crops. However, increasing the use of irrigation can have varying impacts on the nutrition of the local communities. Today, we'll be discussing the trade-offs between nutrition and irrigation sustainability, particularly in the Global South, which can also have major impacts on the livelihood and peace of those in fragile or conflict-affected areas. So I'm joined today by two experts in the field. Piyush Mehta recently finished his PhD in the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences at the University of Delaware. And Dr. Kyle Davis is an assistant professor also in the Department of Geography and Spatial Sciences at the University of Delaware. The inspiration for today's podcast came from a recent seminar series titled, Can Water for Food Help Peaceful Outcomes at World Water Week in Stockholm? My colleague, Nicole LaFleur, uh, who runs our Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Irrigation and Mechanization Systems, participated in the session and felt the topic needed some more attention. So she connected me with one of the speakers, uh, Dr. Mark Mueller, group leader and principal investigator at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, who then connected me to Piyush and Kyle. So I'm excited to welcome them both and um, and happy to provide an expanded discussion on this topic on our podcast today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to start off by giving each of you a couple minutes to introduce yourself and summarize uh, your research and expertise. Well, yeah, thanks so much for, for having us. We're, we're delighted to discuss these topics. These are the things that are really exciting to us. So it's always nice to talk about these things and have a larger platform to spread the word. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm Kyle Davis. I'm an assistant professor at University of Delaware, as you said. I'm really interested broadly in questions related to sustainable food systems and thinking about who are the actors and stakeholders involved in defining what sustainability is, uh, thinking about how do you measure sustainability across different dimensions uh, and using those measures of sustainability to try and evaluate solutions that produce win-wins across a number of outcomes. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the, the connections between food and water. And a, a lot of the work that my group does is focused on sustainable irrigation and water sustainability. So thanks so much for, for having us today. Great, thank you. Thanks, Francis, for inviting me to this podcast. It's uh, really been an honor. Uh, so my my name is Piyush Mehta, and I recently finished my PhD in Geography and Spatial Sciences at the University of Delaware, where I had the privilege of working with Dr. Kyle Davis as my advisor, and I also worked with Mark Mueller as a collaborator on the study. So I'll, I'm, uh, I'll be soon trans transitioning into a new role of product engineer at uh, ESRI, which is a global leader in geographic information system technology. Uh, and so my research focuses on the global expansion of irrigation and its implications for both water sustainability and local nutrition. Uh, specific, and in my PhD, I led the development of a global irrigation, irrigated area data set that mapped irrigation globally. And I also examined the extent of unsustainable irriga irrigation expansion that occurred uh, since the start of the century. So I'm really, uh, all these ideas really uh, interest me uh, to do more research uh, on similar topics. So yeah, I'm really thankful to talk about this project. Great, thanks and, and congratulations on the new gig. So your research has delved into the role irrigation plays in the nutrition of the local community and the food system there. Can you elaborate on how irrigation might improve nutrition, particularly in regions facing water scarcity or challenging climates? So irrigation can play a very important role in uh, improving nutrition of the local community. So one of the primary benefits of irrigation is its ability to enhance food production. So when more food is produced, it often leads to a greater food consumption by the local population, which 
ultimately can translate into improving the overall nutrition of the community. Uh, and another pathway can be, so irrigation can allow for cultivation of crops in the regions that were that would otherwise be unsuitable for agriculture because of limited or no rainfall at all. So in this case, irrigation can enable farmers to grow a variety of crops, including nutritious, sta uh, nutritious staples and vegetables that can improve the overall diet quality of the local population consuming it. And finally, uh, through increased food production, irrigation can also lead to an increased farmer incomes. So this can increase the dietary diversity, which is an indicator of nutrition, how uh, well the diet is of the household. And so uh, with increased incomes, the farmers can ab are able to buy a variety of foods uh, that was not previously possible uh, for, for the farmers. And I think a key addition to that is really Who's, who, who are the people or who are the companies or who are the actors in the places where irrigation expansion is happening that are actually benefiting from that irrigation expansion and who actually have access to that improved irrigation infrastructure? And that's kind of the core of what Piyush's work is, is looking at is there's this underlying assumption that, okay, you expand irrigation in a particular place and it's automatically going to lead to increased food production and nutritional and socioeconomic benefits for, for farmers in that area. But if it's only a few commercial agricultural enterprises that are really the ones that are able to access those additional irrigation resources, then the benefits aren't being shared equitably in a particular place. So. That's really what the, the work is aimed at getting at. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. We will continue with this excerpt of the Water for Food podcast right after this. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Sabrina Halverson. We continue now with an excerpt from the latest Water for Food podcast. Are there unintended consequences of irrigation expansion on nutrition? And are there any risks to making smallholder farmers actually more food insecure? So very good question. So yeah, we also looked at uh, some literature regarding both both sides of the coins. What are the positives and what are the negatives? So uh, there are some unintended consequences of irrigation expansion on nutrition. So as uh, I discussed earlier, that irrigation can lead irrigation expansion can lead to increased farmer incomes through increased food production. So now this increase in income can also result negatively um, affecting their diets and nutrition as farmers can uh, might now start consuming more of the processed foods, which are often less nutritious. And as a result, not only might they reduce their intake of nutrient-rich nutrient foods, but they may also consume these less nutritious options more frequently. And that will ultimately lead to a decline in overall nutrition. And another uh, pathway could be uh, that irrigation expansion can also result in conversion of subsistence farm uh, farms to large scale farms that are often owned by corporations and they usually focus on cash crop production. So this can make the smallholder farmers more food insecure as they might lose their ability to grow nutritious crops for their own. And since the large scale farms primarily are interested in cash crops that are intended for export markets. So as a result of this, uh, farmers can might become more reliant on external food sources, making them uh, vulnerable to fluctuations in food availability and prices. So you're saying that it might affect greatly the types of crops that they grow on their farm, making them lose access then to that diversity of nutrition because they're wanting to sell more high value crops that maybe aren't quite as nutritious or it's all one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think there, there's a whole spectrum of, of uh, potential scenarios or contexts in which these things play out. It can be in a more subsistence type of uh, situation where farmers are directly consuming what they're producing it can be more market-based where farmers are selling some of their product and then using that income to purchase things in the market. Uh, and then there's these dynamics between smallholder and commercial agriculture with implications for land tenure and displacement that that play out in different ways in different places. So how do you 
make sure that the um, the strategies that we're using are having the right impact and not a negative long-term nutrition um, implications for that community. Is there, are there ways to, to weigh that and figure out how to do that? Yeah, I think each, uh, each type of infrastructural investment needs to be tailored to that particular context. I think it's one thing, and, and it's also just one, it's one thing to invest in the expansion of the ear, irrigation infrastructure itself, but it's another thing to think about what are the supporting systems, supporting interventions, or supporting types of activities that are going to properly connect smallholder farmers with those irrigation resources. And so I think a lot of these uh, infrastructural development projects potentially require a more holistic view of what it means to develop this type of infrastructure. Uh, thinking about what are all of the specific steps in the connections linking a smallholder to these water resources and making sure that those are kind of protected along the way. Great. Thank you. Um, how important is sustainable water management in agriculture to these nutrition outcomes? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really important. Um, so sustainable water management is really important in agriculture to uh, nutrition outcomes. So first, I'd say that... Um, it ensures consistent food production. So sustainable water management practices can help maintain a reliable water supply for irrigation, which is essential for a consistent food production for the local population, as well as if the country is a food exporter. So that really helps in maintaining that food production. And also that farmers can depend, when farmers can depend on a stable water source, they are better equipped to grow sufficient quantities of food uh, and also include diverse uh, in, also include fa uh, farming diverse and nutritious crops for both themselves and also for the markets their food is supplying uh, and sustainable water management also enhances the re resilience of crops to climate variability and extremes uh, because that's happening a lot since the start of the century uh, and so by implementing practices such as rainwater harvesting, uh, efficient and efficient irrigation systems, farmers can better withstand the, the effects of uh, climate variability and extremes uh, and, and also contribute to stable food supplies and consequently uh, result in improved food uh, nutrition for the local communities. Yeah, you, know, you can you can also imagine that depending on how sustainably water resources are being used, it can tip the scales in terms of equitable access as well. So in groundwater dominated systems, for example, if there's unsustainable water use that's continuing to happen and to draw down groundwater table levels, really it's only going to be the farmers or companies that have the capital to drill larger, uh, deeper boreholes to be able to access that water. And so smallholders can potentially be left out, even if they're able to have borehole wells or source the ground groundwater. That again from the latest Water for Food podcast. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we're back with this week's Almond Update right after this. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Sabrina Halverson. It's time for this week's Almond Update. Here's Taylor Hillman. We're talking with Jenny Nicolau, Associate Director of the Industry Relations and Global Communications team at the Almond Board of California. Jenny, uh, it's that time of year again where we try to recognize some people in the industry. What's happening? That's right. Every fall, we open up applications to seek nominations for the Almond Achievement Award and the Almond Technical Achievement Award. And this is the Almond Board of California's opportunity to recognize two stellar industry members who really have helped shape the industry into what it is today. Let's go through both of these awards because I know there is some history and um, definitely distinction between the two. Uh, so the Almond Achievement Award, let's talk about that one. This started, oh, gosh, oh, over a decade ago, right? That's right. This one started in 2011. So it's been around for, this will be the 13th year. Um, and when the board of directors created this award, 
The goal was really to recognize one industry member who has added value through long-term service that really helps better the California almond industry. Who makes a good candidate here? I mean, I know that description is there, but if someone's thinking about, you know, does someone qualify, what makes a good candidate for the Almond Achievement Award? I think what comes to mind for me is somebody who's really been in the industry for quite some time. They're directly involved. They have a lasting impact. They're committed to the California almond industry. So they could serve in leadership roles, either on or off the almond board, really engaged in their community. Someone who's just been a pivotal leader and helped shape the industry to where we are today. So I think the takeaway here is someone who's been around for some time, who's really engaged and involved um, and contributes and serves this industry. Now, the Almond Technical Achievement Award, this was created just a few years ago, right? This one's been around for three years. So in 2021, the Almond Technical Achievement Award was created. And this one's a little bit different. So the difference is, with the technical award, it should recognize someone who has added a significant technical advancement. That could be through research, innovation, or helping to facilitate adoption of best practices. And it could be in multiple areas. So think food safety, think in the orchard, um, really someone who's added a technical achievement that helps better the industry. Who, who you you went into detail there some of those categories of people who would be that but who who what would be a good candidate for this when we're thinking about someone for here well i could easily share who's won it in the past so someone like wes asai um, who was a former farm advisor for stanislaus county he has done years and decades worth of research directly in the area of agronomic practices so his research and the way that he has served the industry through best practices He's a prime example. We've also recognized folks in the technical space in food safety, um, which is an area that I think we don't talk about as often. And so these folks are really helping with a practice or the adoption of the research, something that has taken our industry a step farther than if we didn't have that person or that practice. Okay, so two separate awards, the Almond Achievement Award and the Almond Technical Achievement Award. Um, so when we do get all of the nominations, when are these members recognized? When does this come out? It's a little different this year. We will recognize both winners at the Almond Conference. Historically, that was offered at the gala dinner. Um, but we want to really celebrate them with a wide range of attendees. And so this year, both awards will be recognized at the luncheon at the Almond Conference on Wednesday, December 11th. If people are interested, if they're listening to this and are thinking about um, possible nominations, what's the best way to do so? It's actually pretty easy. Just visit almonds.com slash awards, and there's a hyperlink on that page that says nominate someone. The form should take you about five to ten minutes, so really this doesn't take a ton of time. Again, nominations are due by Tuesday, October 29th. And we really do want people to take the time, even though it's a short amount of time, to nominate some individuals so that we could help recognize the leaders and the giants that have helped shape this industry. Yeah, and you'll notice some of those questions, there's information about this person that you're nominating. And, and we should be filling that in with as much information as we can, right? Because if it's not someone that's widely known, we will need some of that information to, to move forward with a, a, a good nomination, right? Absolutely. So while we'll do our best to fill in any cracks with the information, um, if you are nominating someone, please do your best to fill in as much as you know about them so that it really is a shining example of who they are and what they've done. Okay, again, Jenny Nicolau, Associate Director of the Industry Relations and Global Communications um, Group at the Almond Board of California. Thank you for your time. And you can catch the Almond Update once again on our website, agnetwest.com. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Here's Sabrina Halverson. Wrapping up today with some news a USDA report shows a balanced hog market, but with lower prices. Gary Crawford has more. The USDA is out now with its new quarterly hogs and pigs report. What this report is telling us is, you know, that I don't think there was any real big surprises. Not even a couple of small ones. This from USDA livestock analyst Michael McConnell. 
what this report says is more or less is that there are uh, hogs available, um, but more or less the the market appears to be um, fairly well in balance uh, in, in terms of uh, the number of hogs coming in and the way that they're they're being throughput for the next uh, at least in the next uh, couple couple weeks and months. Things are balanced so well that when you go through all the numbers, some up a bit, others down, you get a total hog and pig inventory September 1st of 76.5 million head, almost the exact same number as we had one year ago. But McConnell says there are some interesting market forces going on under the surface, some of which are putting pressure on prices first. Probably one of the key dynamics that's, that's kind of still playing itself out now um, within the hog industry is, is we continue to see a pigs per litter rate at a national level. Um, that's still relatively high. We've been seeing that now from the past several reports uh, going back a year, a year ago now. USDA reports that during the summer quarter, average pigs saved per litter was 11.7. It was 11.6 in the summer of 23. And so with higher pigs per litter rate, um, there's been a bit of an adjustment in terms of the uh, the, the number of uh, sows uh, needed for farrowing. Um, and so we do see, you know, year over year, we do see relatively lower farrowing levels, at least the past couple quarters. Um, but, you know, obviously with the higher pigs per litter, that means we're getting uh, bigger pig crops uh, for the most part um, compared to what we were doing historically. You know, it does show that we have have and have had more hog supplies um, overall from for much of the year, which... Um, maybe it's been putting a little bit of downward pressure on, on hog price, particularly over the summer when we typically get a, a seasonal bump uh, in hog prices as well as the wholesale uh, pork prices. Um, and that was a little bit muted this year. Definitely muted. USDA says hogs in August averaged $67.80 a hundredweight. That's almost $6 below August of 2023. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The latest annual measurement of sustainable agricultural production growth worldwide reflects adjustments needed to reach total sustainability globally by the year 2050. Rod Bain reports. Total factor productivity. What is that? Agricultural productivity growth, measured as total factor productivity, increases either by generating more output with the same or fewer resources and inputs, or by maintaining the same output while using fewer resources and inputs. Tom Thompson of Virginia Tech University says this index provides measurement of world agricultural production via sustainable methods. TFP is the indicator as part of Virginia Tech's annual global agriculture Cultural Productivity Initiative report. The source of data used for this study, USDA's Economic Research Service. Each year, the GAP report uses the Global Agricultural Productivity data set curated by Dr. Keith Fugley and his team at USDA ERS to report on trends in global agricultural productivity. For the 2024 GAP report, the theme for this year's report is Powering Productivity. In this report, we will summarize the most recent agricultural productivity trends globally. We'll also emphasize the importance of bridging the gap between innovation and widespread adoption. And in the case of TFP, TFP rises when producers use innovative agricultural technologies and knowledge. Because TFP incorporates a wide range of inputs and outputs in its calculation, it's the broadest available measure of technical efficiency and productivity over time. Such changes in TFP growth have been observed since 2010. Designed to measure future growth necessary to sustainably fulfill world farm and food production by the year 2050. For this year's GAP report, measuring TFP growth for the period of 2013 through 2022, the GAP index target, which was a projected rate of 1.73% annual TFP growth during 2010 to 2050, was based on the assumption that agricultural outputs would need to double between 2010 and 2050 to support a projected population of 10 billion people. However, at only 0.74%, 
percent. The global average annual TFP growth during 2013 to 2022 fell well below the 1.73 percent annual growth target. Thompson says this means an adjustment of the gap target of 2 percent average annual growth between now and 2050 to achieve sustainable ag production to meet all global needs by the end of the period. The gap between actual and needed TFP growth is becoming increasingly difficult to close. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit AgNetWest at AgNetWest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at AgNetWest on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Also look for Sabrina Halverson on Facebook, and be sure to subscribe to our podcast by searching for AgNetWest on your podcast app. Thank you for listening to the AgNet News Hour from AgNetWest. AgNet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.